Hello everybody, it's me Ghost Critic. It's time for some comic book review videos. And uh, something went crazy with my camera uh, just now because I have actually already, or thought I already filmed this. Um, and then my camera went fluey. And so I stopped and just continued on. Um, and now the first half of what I recorded wasn't there. So I'm having to do this again. <laughs> Um, the premise of this video is that um, it's been the Easter Bank holiday weekend. I, it feels like ages since I've read my comic books. I think I've finished mo pretty much all of them last Wednesday with a couple that I read on Thursday. And I'm just trying to remember what actually went on in them. Um, I've, I've had a great Easter weekend uh, full of food and fun and a lot of chocolate eggs, I have to say. Um, so trying to remember what happened in my comic books um, probably was a bit um, of a struggle this week. Um, but hopefully, now this is my second go at it, I'll remember a bit more about it. Um, and we might as well kick off with the four that I spoke about in the first part of the video before it went woo -hoo, off it went. Uh, and we start with Colin Bunn, issue number 24 of X-Men Blue. Uh, unfortunately this book does seem to be uh, heading towards the bottom of my pile to read with each issue that comes out unfortunately because it started off really strongly and I had fun with all these time displaced um, teenagers, the original X-Men from when they were uh, younger and just kind of starting out in their mutant life. Uh, but now it's kind of morphed into uh, all sorts of craziness uh, and throwing in lots of different storylines that perhaps are going on in other X titles, which I don't get. Um, and this is definitely predominantly with the whole Zorn storyline, the Zorn with an X, not with a Z. Because uh, the last time I read Zorn and what was going on with his life was the Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly run where they introduced him into the into the school, the academy, as a teacher. But it wasn't really Zorn, it was Magneto in disguise. But then Scott Summers found him in space to rescue him. And that's pretty much all I know. But we find him here, I guess, hiding out in the desert, wanting to be left alone. Uh, but we have these two uh, vying mutant teams wanting Zorn to come and join them. Uh, on the one half, we've got... Uh, Jimmy Hudson and uh, Bloodstorm, both from kind of alternate mutant X universes, uh, want uh, trying to rescue him from the kind of the bad um, <laughs> the bad mutants, uh, and they do kind of escape with him. But to what ends, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, we continue on with the fight between Sebastian Shaw and Magneto. Uh, Sebastian Shaw has had his mutant powers amped up by this mother vine that we're not entirely sure what it what that deal is all about but these powers are short-lived uh, and they don't seem to last um, infinitely uh, and uh, Magneto manages to turn the tide uh, and uh, Sebastian loses the powers and he becomes this kind of old frail guy and again Magneto gets some answers to what he came to the Hellfire Club for. Uh, Polaris is still uh, fighting and being used by the Malice entity uh, and she's just knocking these kind of kids from Madripoor, the mutant team, uh, left, right and centre. Um, unfortunately, right at the end of the battle where she's taking down all these poor kids who, who came to uh, hopefully um, not join the team but uh, a kind of... Uh, to, to trust them, uh, that trust is clearly going to have, have dissipated and gone again um, because she smacks them all down and at the last second uh, Polaris takes hold, uh, re-hold of her mind uh, and kicks the kind of malice entity back out. Um, Polaris in, in past volumes of wherever she's been ha has been through a lot more and uh, been tested a lot harder than uh, Malice could ever imagine and so was able to take back hold again. And then right at the end you've got the whole Havoc and Emma and um, Miss Sinister and one other guy, he was the Sentinel, I can't remember what he's called now, Mental Recall. 
Um, uh, they're, they're doing this kind of dark cabal kind of thing um, uh, in the background with this mother vine. Uh, but I think Havoc and Emma uh, are both kind of double agents that, you know, they're pretending to be bad but actually aren't. Um, just keep, kind of keeping tabs on the bad guys, I think. Um, and this is why it's it's always so low. I mean, it's an okay X title. It's it's kind of just above average, and why I still collect it. Um, but I I just wanted to have a bit more umph. But I don't know whether we're going to get that because it's not one of the, like the the flagship X titles that um, that Marvel have. Uh, we move on to Moon Knight issue 193, which I guess this is the culmination, the conclusion of the crazy in the fam crazy runs in the family storyline, where we have the final smackdown between uh, Mark Spector as Moon Knight, the avatar of uh, Kong Shu, and this crazy criminal guy who thinks he's the avatar of the sun god, Sun Ra. Uh, and it's that kind of superhero trope where the good guy is on the ropes, looks like he's going to be defeated, but finds somewhere within him for that one last smackdown. And apparently this is due to the power of crazy. Yes, we already get the fact that Moon Knight um, and his kind of split personalities um, are, are crazy to say the least. Uh, but they throw in this whole kind of psychological um, kind of concept. Um, part of it is, yes, uh, that this... this strange kind of power of crazy that push gives him the push to to defeat uh, and to basically put the fear of Kong Shu into uh, this avatar of the sun god but then they throw in uh, his uh, his Jake Lockley persona's daughter uh, I think it's um, what was her name I can't remember her name now, but it, it, that, that's, that's the other extra push, uh, the idea of protecting the innocent, um, and, and this comes in the guise of his daughter, and manages to break the hold that this uh, this avatar has over all the people that, that he's brought along to this island for this new wonderful life and suddenly the, I guess the kind of spell has been broken and now they're all kind of followers of Konshu um, or at least that kind of what it feels like. Um, it, I, with this I think it Yes, it's going to be nicely wrapped up in a, in a I guess, a six-issue trade, but did it really need six issues to tell this whole story? I don't really think so, as as fun as it has been. Um, I'm now interested to see where Max Bemis takes Moon Knight on his next adventure. Uh, moving on to The Flash and Perfect Storm, where it's always good to have a... a decent artist back on. It was terrible last issue. Uh, we have now back with uh, Gio Domenico on our and it's much better and kind of helps the not so original storyline that we have within Flash. Uh, Grodd the gorilla has kind of taken a great big chunk of the speed force away and uh, with that extra power has now taken over the minds of all Barry Allen's kind of teammates uh, and um, sidekicks uh, and they're all ganging up on the Flash uh, but it's kind of like the power of love, uh, the power of hope, um, the, the power of uh, you know the, the morality of not fighting back, of believing in your friends uh, and it's kind of like the turning point for Barry having uh, thought he could do everything on his own but realising that he needs um, his family, his Flash family by his side and he kind of does what he should have done right at the very beginning uh, and used this lightning rod which has kind of become a bit of a, a deuces machina kind of object uh, to cure Grodd uh, which you would think he would be happy about but by curing him of this kind of degenerative 
degenerative mental disease that Grodd had. Um, it's taken his connection away from the Speed Force and now he's just kind of a normal, kind of <laughs> normal, oversized gorilla with heightened mental capacity. But that's not enough for Grodd. He's had a taste of the Speed Force, the power that comes with it, and he would rather die than not have it. So he uses that lightning rod again to... Um, break its control over this storm that is being held in check um, above Central City. Now the storm is free and is going to destroy the whole of, of, the, of the Central City. And so I'm guessing it's going to be up to Flash and all his teammates, along with Mina now, who has grip of God has, has gone. She realises all the bad things she's done and what she's messed up on. Um, uh, they're obviously all going to come together uh, and hopefully save Central City. Uh, so yeah, it's a fun book. The art elevates this from just being an okay flash story to, you know, something that I want to read and look at and enjoy and be entertained by. Uh, now we get on to the next issue, which is Hungry Ghosts, issue three of Four. Um, I don't know how much I managed to speak about this when I first tried to um, talk about this book, uh, but when there's a little break, it it'll just it'll have to make sense because I can't do the whole thing all again. But Hungry Ghost anthology series uh, with a different artist for each story. I'm kind of sad that this is gonna only a four issue mini series because the whole kind of concept around it. I feel can go much further. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of creators and artists and writers out there that would um, enjoy doing kind of a short kind of ghost horror story um, to continue this uh, this anthology series. Um, and this time, the two stories, they're they're okay. Uh, it's very much about the the art style in this in this um, series rather than how strong the stories are, um, which is a shame, but still very pretty to look at. Uh, the first story set in um, a kitchen uh, with the kind of hierarchy of um, the, the kitchen staff uh, and the kind of bullying that goes on within um, that particular uh, environment. Now, I'm going to stop the video now. Um, it'll have to try and make sense in the cut. Uh, stay with me. If I repeat myself, I'm sorry, my camera did weird things. Sorry about that, we had a little bit of a camera misfunction, uh, malfunction between that. Um, so I'll kind of continue on where I was with Hungry Ghosts, where, so yes, there was this kind of oriental looking chef who was looking at everything that was going on in this kitchen and he wasn't happy and he was kind of, I guess willing to help him out but it just kind of turned out that he was this kind of turtly kind of demon guy um, who wanted to eat chefs. Um, it just ended very strangely uh, and kind of wasn't, it just wasn't the best kind of flowing storyline. There was too much kind of set up and not enough kind of horror at the end of it all. Um, now in the second story, um, there's a little bit more horror and a kind of open-ended kind of tale uh, to this to this horror story where a young guy, uh, he gets this boil on his stomach, which turns out to be a mouth and the mouth needs feeding and it's forever forever hungry uh, and of course this and it's the first time it's been used this is a hungry ghost that resides inside this guy's stomach uh, which turns into this kind of alien worm looking parasite that gets pushed pushed up uh, sorry not pushed pulled out of the guy's stomach to try and kind of save him from this continual having to eat and eat and satisfy the monster, this ghost thing within him. Uh, but the kind of twist on this was as they've pulled this uh, kind of 
parasitic worm which is huge out of his stomach they all go away chopping away at it killing it or what they think they're killing it but much like kind of a worm uh, every time you split it it becomes two different entities and this is what's happened that and there's kind of a I kind of almost fade to black out where it's like this was only the start of their kind of worries and it's clear that these little parasites infected these particular people that were trying to save the one guy. Um, it was a fun kind of tale. Uh, the Paul Pope art uh, the the, uh, the Paul Pope artwork in it was great. Love his his style, uh, kind of hip indie edge to it. Um, it's been a nice little series. I'm kind of sad that it's it's going to go away. I'm like I said at the top. I'm sure we could have got uh, more people uh, to come on board and, and write more stories for this. Uh, moving on to issue three hundred and two of Peter Parker. Spectacular Spider-Man and they're still in the past, still doing all sorts of crazy stuff that must, must affect the future. I don't get this. And the big one on here is that uh, the Green Goblin, Harry Osborn, um, finds the identity of Peter Parker because the two J. Jonah Jamesons, the one from the past and one from the present day, have chatted and uh, the one from the present has revealed the identity of Spider-Man and told the old J. Jonah Jameson, you know, take it easy on him. But of course, this is the story of the century for him and he's done a mock-up uh, of the front page of the Daily Bugle. And this is what Osborne sees and goes and takes the fight back home. And that's where we have uh, Aunt May uh, tied up and gagged on the sofa while Osborne awaits the return of Spider-Man, the young Peter Parker. Uh, other bits get thrown in there. We get a little brief uh, visit from uh, Flash, uh, Flash Thompson. Uh, the I think it's pretty put uh, laid to rest that... Um, Teresa is the daughter of the Parkers and hence it is now Peter Parker's sister. I think that's pretty much been proved now. Uh, who knows? But still in the back of my mind, I can't get out of the fact that how Doom can say that nothing they're going to do in the past is going to affect the future. Uh, uh, the present day unless of course he was lying and the amount of stuff that's going on here the amount of changing things uh, that could affect the future here they seem to have forgotten about the whole tinkerer finding his notes um, uh, and assisting in that to, to stop the alien invasion that's going on uh, but it's crazy it's silly it's it's Chip Zazarski doing kind of a time travelly thing and I get confused with those. We can only see what will what will happen. Uh, saga issue number 50, chapter 50. And in a kind of true kind of meta type way that Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Staples love to do on this, you would think that issue 50 would be uh, an extravaganza anniversary issue. And they kind of play and fool around with the idea that uh, the mum and dad, uh, Marco Alana, Alanis, Alana, Alana, oh dear, memory gone. Anyway, the, the, the mother and father um, are kind of having a date night um, and of course with Saga they've always got to have that kind of brash supposedly shocking first page uh, and it's basically them in the throes of passion. Um, Marco performing cunnilingus on his wife in the middle of a pool um, uh, and just basically having a bit of downtime and, and kind of trying to decide what their next move is which is good for the reader because it's like what have you been doing all this time and it's kind of been my deal with uh, this um, this particular arc for a while where they just came kind of stopped and this, it seems to be directionless. But now it, it seems to be moving on a little bit, deciding what's going to happen next. Um, we've got the, the reporters and the Prince Robot, who's going to go into the kind of witness protection um, 
that that kind of the saga version i guess of um the witness protection program where he's going to get his identity completely changed so he's going to lose the robot head after telling his story about how these two warring factions have actually um, in the background uh, perhaps been working together rather than uh, to continue this war rather than you know coming together and joining and you know stopping fighting each other um and and then of course you've got the the will and his captor uh and I'm not really quite sure what's going on there either, apart from the fact they're trying to catch up with um, our Saga family. I said on Wednesday in the comments section, because uh, I think it was Kami, or I can't remember if it was Kami or Larissa, uh, I think it was Kami who said that she had stopped buying Saga and I think she's uh, waiting for, for trade now. Uh, and I did say in the comment section about Saga, it's become one of those titles where I don't know whether I'm buying it now because I'm enjoying it or I have this sense of loyalty to it. I've been with it now for 50 issues and it's just become sort of like a habit of buying it month after month despite my um, reluctance, I guess, uh, and uh, my... A lack of enthusiasm, uh, I guess, at times for for the book. It's 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 a it's a head scratcher. I just don't know what to do about it. It would be, I guess, a, a, an interesting time just to drop this now. We we've read the first fifty issues, uh, but I have this kind of thing where I can't, I know it's stupid and you can laugh at me all you like. But I can't go from buying singles to going to trades. I have to buy one or the other. I can't mix and match. It, it's, to me, it feels wrong. <laughs> and then next book, uh, we're coming up to the top three in just a moment. We've got Exo Man of War from Valiant Comics. Matt Kint with issue 13. Uh, and I guess this kind of wraps up the, the story on this planet as Arik manages to uh, defeat the bounty hunters, makes a deal with them to send them off on their way, uh, and leaves him now in a kind of dilemma. Does he stay on this planet, or does he go back home to Earth, which the next storyline is called Earthbound, so he's off. Um, he's kind of accepted the armour now that he is this warrior um, that the the armour in some respects does define who he is and his purpose um, he seems to have have come to that realisation in himself and there are lots of goodbyes here especially to his I don't know is it his wife or is it his lover from this planet but um it, it, it's some nice kind of uh, touching moments uh, that happen towards the end of this. But um, great run by uh, Matt Ken. I'm not sure how much more of this there is to go, but I'm still on board. And uh, I guess more adventures can only happen as he heads back home to Earth. But great stuff. Great sci-fi fun. Now... <laughs> Um, issue two of The Beef. Yes, this is incredibly high up my list. Um, and I think it's primarily because of Shaky Kane and his art style. Because I can't really explain what this story is about. At first it felt like this kind of diatribe uh, and lecturing about how bad uh, kind of meat production is and the meat is bad and trying to convert everyone to either uh, kind of vegetarianism or veganism. Uh, but in this issue it's kind of switched um, and looking at, I guess, immigration, um, this kind of Mexican family and their story of uh, coming over the border into America to try and live the kind of the American dream, but finding uh, even just getting over there is costing them so much. And uh, these kind of these runners that take. Uh, I guess illegal immigrants across the border hiding them on top of engines and within kind of um, the whatever gap they can get in the car to hide them in uh, to get them over the border 
Uh, I mean, uh, half of the difficulty of this book is that a lot of it is in Mexican. Uh, and unless you've got the time to kind of type it into some sort of uh, internet translator, this is kind of... Uh, it's not necessarily a tough read. It's a quick read because unless you can actually speak Mexican um, and you can read that, you might as well just fly by it. Um, as I said... For me, though, it's the artwork. It's Shaky Kane doing that glorious kind of 60s pastiche, uh, kind of psychedelia, really kind of indie, underground kind of art style that I just adore. I will pick up anything he uh, he draws, uh, even if the story just, just makes no sense. And I guess that's really why um, I'm so entertained by this book and why it's so high on my list. Uh, the uh, penultimate book this week is uh, a landmark for Daredevil. It's uh, issue 600. Um, I don't know how we're going to fit that in, but uh, or how they've got to 600, but they have. Um, and this is the culmination of the Mayor Fisk storyline and kind of wraps up a few bits, leave things hanging, explains a few things, throws some new stuff in the mix. Um, we kick off with uh, Muse and Blindspot having their rooftop fight. And uh, something that kind of comes out of the blue but still makes sense. Um, you will remember that Blind Spot went back home to, I think it was China, and got involved with this demon that uh, Matt Merlot had to come and rescue him from, where he uh, kind of got his eyesight back. Uh, that demon is still around, it's still in his head, um, and uh, taunting him. To, to take up his offer to help him fight this battle with Muse. But at the moment, Blind Spot is resisting, uh, but that's clearly a storyline that's going to, to play out, I'm guessing, in future issues. Uh, uh, will Blind Spot go rogue and turn to the dark side? And obviously the big huge story is um, the hopeful takedown of Wilson Fisk and his kind of crime syndicate that he's putting in places of power within his um, his government so to speak. Uh, all these heads of departments like you know education uh, and uh, crime and the police and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and. Uh, it's up to our band of um, kind of street level vigilante superheroes to um, take them all down. But Fisk is always one step ahead here as this has been one big trap for, uh, for them all as Wilson Fisk isn't going to this big meeting with all these heads uh, and as the superheroes go crashing in to get the, all these villains um, in, back in prison, back behind bars, uh, it leaves them open to the police as well as they are now wanted criminals within New York City. Uh, and Wilson Fisk is giving his big speech in um, in some sort of big arena, uh, getting the crowds all worked up. But it is the final fight, uh, uh, smackdown between Daredevil and Fisk, which kind of ends surprisingly um, where it's not Daredevil that takes down Fisk, but it's the hand. Now, I'm trying again. It's It's my memory. It's getting old. It's fading. I'm not quite sure where the hand fits into this all, all of this. Uh, I'm trying to remember where they've been used in this storyline, but they just suddenly seem to come out of nowhere and take down uh, Wilson Fisk. Um, and uh, he won't be, but apparently his life is in the balance and he could die. Um, at the end of this, uh, Daredevil is carted away in the kind of the prison, uh, the police van to be put on trial. Um, to go to prison and using his super hearing he's heard you know that Wilson Fisk is now in, in hospital you know trying to um, the brink of death uh, and who has to take over from Wilson Fisk well due to some laws that didn't get changed or was put in there um, it's Matt Murdock but how can he the twist he's going to prison as daredevil um, 
it was a great culmination to this storyline. I really love what Charles Sewell is doing on this book. There's a backup story of um, about Foggy Nelson and all his time with Matt from the beginning days when he went to college with him as law students. Uh, and it, it, it's a nice if you if you're not up to date with. Um, with kind of daredevil mythology and in certain respects with Foggy. Uh, it's a nice little roundup of of the whole kind of entire life of Foggy. So uh, it's a nice little end bit to bump up this 600 page, uh, 600 page, the 600th issue um, anniversary edition. Finally, we get to our pick of the week and I just love this book. Uh, it's such a gorgeous thing to read. Uh, it's The Highest House, uh, Mike Carey and Peter Gross teaming up again after being on The Unwritten, uh, doing a kind of fantasy story, mixing uh, magic and uh, and in some respects there's kind of almost a kind of authorian legend to this. Um, but we have this young boy who's been uh, bought as a slave for this big family in this uh, kind of big castle and its surrounding areas. Uh, and, and the struggle that he has um, with his new job as a roofer of all things. Um, but it, it's the danger, it's... Um, it's, it's the magic that they get through involved in this, uh, the excitement, the adventure, the threat of danger. And then there is this kind of disembodied voice again, this kind of uh, something within uh, the walls of this kind of castle it is uh, tempting uh, the young boy to, to come and release him uh, from, from, I guess, uh, some sort of uh, prison that, that, that this body's in and uh, one night he goes out and goes searching for uh, the kind of source of this voice uh, and he has to basically do a, a deal uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to go well this kind of voice uh, I guess it's this obsidian uh, rock that he finds with something housed inside it uh, which needs to escape and needs this young boy because uh, the boy has this these unknown powers it hasn't really been explained uh, I guess they're in its infancy um, but has the power to release uh, whatever's inside the rock we don't see it at the end a deal has to be struck it's almost like a kind of genie-esque deal you get kind of three wishes um, and which he will perform as long as the boy releases whatever's inside this huge rock uh, but it, it's just glorious from start to finish uh, it, it's wonderful storytelling by Mark Carey Mike Carey um, the artwork, it, it's so Vertigo-esque, um, uh, it's a surprise this didn't come out on Vertigo. I love the fact that it comes out in these magazine size. I don't care that I've got nothing to put this in to kind of keep it nice. Um, uh, and the way I'm going to store it, I don't know. Uh, at the moment it's just sitting on my shelves. Uh, but I'm, I'm in for the haul. I, it's, it's this sense of wonderment that you get from uh, Mike Carey and Peter Gross doing, you know, kind of the high fantasy concept. And, and I'm in for the long haul on this magical adventure. So I don't think I did too bad there remembering what went on in the books. I hope you enjoyed yourself uh, listening to all this uh, and me ramble on. I believe because we have had a bank holiday, my comics will be a day late. So new comic book day probably won't be till Thursday. I hope you'll join me then. If you're not a subscriber and you're enjoying what you're seeing, you've been looking at my back catalogue, then hit the subscribe button and you won't miss out on any new videos. If this video a big thumbs up, let me know you enjoyed it and tell me what I missed from my books uh, down in the comment section below. Uh, I'll be there looking out for all your comments. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.